Welcome, everyone. Let's start our morning with a time of announcements. What would we like to share? Just going to say a quick one, just a reminder that, you know, we're trying out this 10 o'clock meeting time. And uh, we do have a board meeting, not this coming Tuesday, but a week from, uh, which is also a primary election day. But anyway, uh, if you have some thoughts about the 10 o'clock meeting time, uh, I imagine we might be talking about it at board meeting, so let somebody on the board know. Any other announcements this morning? If not, let's prepare ourselves for worship. It finally feels like spring has arrived this weekend. It feels like it's finally here. Each year it seems like it takes longer and longer, even though we know it doesn't, but it just feels that way. So I have an endless to-do list, and I'm very sore this morning and slow to get up and down. I've got to get out there and get busy, and I'm not even a farmer. I can't even imagine what it's like for them this time of year. But spring also reminds me of God's promises. There's no other time of year that reminds me that like spring. Like the one he made in Genesis, when the floodwaters finally receded and Noah and his family were convinced to exit the ark, and God promised never to flood the earth again and said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. We're a week past Easter now, and we've just relived the awesome extent of God's promises. Let us rejoice this morning and every morning that he keeps his promises. Would you pray with me this morning? Awesome God, we meet this morning to glorify you. Your steadfast word gives us hope and teaches us faith. As we begin this new season, let us remember all of this exists because of your promises. What was once cold and dreary will awaken with new life because of you. Amen. Let's open our service this morning with hymn number 573, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
that song is a wonderful reminder that we need to take things to the Lord in prayer more than we do. I often think things are just too trivial, and I shouldn't, but we need to, do, to take everything to the Lord in prayer. I'd like to ask you now if you have um, some concerns weighing you down that you would like us to help and pray with you for. Please step up to the microphone and share them with us. If there's nothing else, let's come together in prayer. Lord, you have heard our concerns and what's touching our hearts, those that we spoke to one another and those that we spoke only to you. Please help us as we make difficult decisions that affect ourselves and other people. Please help us as we test our future and our journey. And we thank you for the gifts that you have given the members of this congregation that we share out in the community. We know those gifts come from, from you and that we are intended to use them. In your name we pray, amen. Speaking of gifts, it's the time of uh, service that we acknowledge um, our gifts and that we give back to the church and to the community. If you haven't already done so, please feel free at this time to come up and drop your um, gifts and let's see, the special offering this month is, thank you, Fellowship of Churches. And that would be in the bowl and the regular offering in the plate. Before our next hymn, let's take a moment for children's story. If we have children among us, I think Carolyn has something prepared for us. Good morning. Glad to have more than one child here today. And tell Harvey I missed him today and Kendall because I think they would enjoy this dandelion thing. You see these dandelions here? Well, they're not real hard to find, except actually in my yard, I didn't know if I was going to find any because they work hard to get rid of those dandelions. And, um, but. God provided dandelions right along my drive and right along the neighbor's drive, so I got plenty of dandelions. Could have had even more. Okay. The thing we're going to talk about dandelions is that we really like spring, right? I love the flowers. Most beautiful time of year. The trees are budding out. We're going to have leaves soon. We're going to have lots of flowers. So the grass is getting really nice and green. Did you ever pick a bouquet of dandelions for your mom, Sarah? Mm -mm. Well, she might need one, but I'll tell you, they don't last long. I picked some yesterday afternoon. They were gone by this morning. They would just kind of shrivel up and die. But, you know... People try hard to get rid of dandelions, but they pop up everywhere. It doesn't matter where they grow. They just want to grow. And, you know, those little, uh, the fluff on the dandelion that comes after the flower, that spreads the dandelions. So if you blow on them, you're going to get lots more dandelions, which might be good. So, you know, really, we should be more like dandelions right? More popping up, more show, showing our light. Dandelions are kind of like light. The greenhouse? <laughs> they might grow in the floor. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you know, they grow whether we plant them or not. We never, we never would plant dandelions. They just grow anyway. They're in the seed catalog, really. And you can uh, order dandelions, huh? I, don't, I can't imagine anybody wanting to order them. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to plant any. The daffodils I planted were 
they're coming up nicely, so we'll we'll leave it at that. But maybe we should, as Christians, should be more like dandelions. We can pop up in places like dandelions where we can be helpful and truthful and share Jesus' love. Right? The scripture. Yeah, we could we can sing that in a minute. Okay. So let me tell you why you are here. This is from the message, Matthew 13, but I'm going to read 14 and 15. You're here to be the light, to bring out God's uh, colors in the world. If you put a light under a bucket or a bushel, it will not shine, right? You got to put it up on the hill. Okay, so we want to keep shining. We want to keep shedding our light and showing other people God's love. And that's the way we can be the light. Okay, you want to sing that song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hiding under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hiding under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. We have a prayer. Dear God, help us to let our light shine so that others may see our good works and um, imitate them and uh, especially bring light in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I would like to invite Bob Bowman up to uh, give us, share with us his message this morning. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to Thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> well, today is the first Sunday after Easter. In those traditional churches that follow the written liturgy, the uh, the prayer for the Sunday that comes right after liturgy is a quotation from Second Peter, no, First Peter, chapter two, and verse two. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. I love that. That's a nice, nice, nice prayer, and it's especially a nice prayer for those whose faith has been reawakened. Uh, during the celebration of the resurrection and the Easter services and so forth. A whole new newborn infant all over again. In the Middle Ages, of course, <clears throat> the prayer would have been said in Latin, beginning quasi modo geniti infantes. Quasi modo, quasi modo is the way it begins. And that's why this Sunday was called Quasi Modo Sunday. Quasimodo Sunday, and since he was born on Quasimodo Sunday, that's why the hunchback of Notre Dame is called Quasimodo, in case you're interested, and even if you're not interested. It's, uh... In America, Quasimodo Sunday doesn't usually get called Quasimodo Sunday. It's called Low Sunday, probably because in those churches that uh, follow the liturgy, they use the high liturgy, high mass for Easter and celebrations of that nature. And then when you get to a Sunday after that, you're back to the ordinary, the uh, low mass or low liturgy and so forth.
Quasimodo, I like, especially when I remember that newborn infants kind of thing. Low Sunday, that gives me a little more pause. Is this just back to normal Sunday? Low Sunday reminds me of the uh, 21st chapter of John. <laughs> there are the disciples. They experienced Palm Sunday with Jesus, that exciting ride into Jerusalem with the car, um, clothing cloaks and everything over the road and palm branches waving. They, then, then they were with Jesus during that week in Jerusalem. They shared that meal in the upper room with Jesus, that precious meal. They felt fear on the night on which he was arrested. They hid from a distance, but they felt the pain of the crucifixion. And then Easter Sunday morning, the resurrection. I mean, the joy, the amazement, it just knocked their boots off. They, uh, they, they, they met with Jesus after the resurrection. And Jesus even offered to let Thomas touch the wounds in his hands and his side. I mean, wow, have they ever got a story to tell to the nations. There's the resurrection. And then, <clears throat> then we turn the page to chapter 21 in John. And what do you expect the disciples to do next? They go back to Jerusalem and start fishing again. Back to normal. Low Sunday. Life is normal. What were they thinking of? But who am I to speak? I, uh, I can remember when as a pastor... Um, I welcomed the let up from all the work and the busyness and the activity that went around uh, special days like Easter and days of that in a very active church. But may God forgive me, but the idea of a back to normal Sunday felt pretty good sometimes. Now, apart from wondering how the pastor feels before resurrection and after resurrection, let me think about it another way. What difference does it make to a Christian? What's different about a Christian, about the Christian life, about the Christian way of being before the resurrection and after the resurrection? And I want to explore that question by reading again that classic after resurrection story, the walk to Emmaus. Because of all of the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, this is the story that is most like me. I'll never have the experience of walking on the hills of Galilee with the living, breathing, physical Jesus. I live after the resurrection. Every experience we have with Jesus is an experience of the risen Christ. Luke's gospel ends here, and our gospel begins here, and they overlap with this story of the walk to Emmaus. I'm going to read it, and I want to read it slowly and in a little different translation. And if you want to follow along, I would encourage you to follow along in your Bible. It's in the Gospel of Luke. It's in chapter 24, which is the very last chapter in the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke. You can find it more easily by going to John and then just backing up a little bit. And uh, I'm going to read, beginning at verse 13, the first 12 verses in this story, in this chapter, uh, tell the story of the women discovering that empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning and um, getting all excited, and Peter racing to the tomb to make sure that the women knew what they were talking about, a typical male reaction. And then we began reading at verse 13. Now, on this very same day, it just so happened that two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. <laughs> Luke's uh, two of them is a little bit vague. Two of them who? The twelve disciples? No. Two of the large group of followers of Jesus? Maybe. Verse 14, they were talking together about the way all these things had turned out. And during their excited conversation back and forth, Jesus himself approached and joined them. But their eyes were so held that they didn't recognize him. It was not clear what held their eyes. Was it, was it God? Was it the devil? 
was maybe their belief that Jesus was dead, so it certainly couldn't be him over here. Uh, it does happen sometimes that what we believe to be true affects what we can see. I think they call that confirmation bias. Or maybe their eyes were held by the intensity of their conversation. They were so wrapped up in what they were talking about so intensely that they couldn't see. Talking so much about Jesus can prevent one from seeing Jesus sometimes. Talking about Jesus is not nearly the same as talking to Jesus. That happens sometimes. Verse 17. So Jesus said to them, what's all this you are discussing so intensely while you walk? And they just stood there looking glum. One named Cleopas responded, you've got to be the only person visiting Jerusalem and not aware of what's been happening in these days in the city. If one was Cleopas, who was the other one? I don't know. And then nobody knows. Of course, not knowing did not prevent the early church from making a bunch of guesses. Um, one of the popular guesses was that it was somebody named Simon, but not Simon Peter. Another popular guess that it was Nathaniel. And he was walking with Cleopas because Cleopas was the first cousin of Jesus, and Cleopas became the second archbishop of Jerusalem. Well, they, they were just making guesses, too. My guess is it was Mrs. Cleopas. Why not? It could be. Verse 19, <clears throat> Jesus asked, <clears throat> what kind of things? And they begin to tell him <clears throat> the things about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a man who became a powerful prophet in words and actions before God and all the people. And how the head priests and our leaders turned him over to be sentenced to death. And they had him crucified. We were hoping that he was the one to liberate Israel. On top of this, it's now the third day since this happened, and some of our women astonished us. They came upon the tomb early this morning, and they didn't find the body. They came back saying they had a vision of angels who said he lives. Some of our group went to the tomb and found things just as the women had said, and they didn't see him either. Ah, uh, Verse 25, ah, said Jesus, too thick of wit and slow of heart to rest your faith on all the message of the prophets. I got to stop here for some observations. Do you notice that Jesus um, rather gently points to their deficiencies in both brain and heart? Thinking about faith needs to be done with both the head, logic, reason, clear thinking, common sense, and also by the heart, intuition, feelings, spiritual sensitivity, emotions. And the head and the heart need to be kept in balance. Another interesting thing here that Jesus guides Cleopas and his friend into thinking about the meaning of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus by saying, encouraging them to rest their faith on the message of the prophets. Verse 26, wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to experience suffering before entering his glory? And then starting with Moses and going on through the prophets, he interpreted all the passages about himself in the scriptures. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Starting with Moses and going through the prophets, he interpreted all the passages about himself in the scriptures. <laughs> Isn't that something? A Bible study led by Jesus. Wouldn't you love to be there? Uh, verse 28. By now they had drawn near the village where they were headed, and it seemed like he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us. It's evening and already the light is fading. So he entered the hostel with them. And after he took his place with them at the table, it happened that he took the bread, offered the grace, and breaking it, he handed it to them. And with that, 
their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished. It's interesting that he took the bread, offered grace, and broke it and gave it to them, because actually it was Cleopas that invited him. And so technically, Cleopas should have taken the bread, offered the prayer, and broken it for them. And uh, with that, with that, their eyes were open. With, with what? With which one? Which that? Did they recognize Jesus by the way he prayed grace over the meal? Some of you may remember Anna Mao. She was a popular brethren speaker, writer, spiritual advisor of a generation ago. Most folks who remember her don't remember her husband, Baxter, but he was a gem. I was present when uh, someone privately griped to me about Baxter's prayers. The griper said, I couldn't tell he was praying. He just sounded like he was having a conversation with somebody. <laughs> Duh. I can imagine Jesus being recognized by the intimacy of his prayers. Maybe, on the other hand, it was the recognizing Jesus by the breaking of the bread. Almost the same words are used of that taking the bread, offering grace, breaking the bread, giving it to them. You're going to find that in the story of the upper room. Maybe Cleopas one is one of those present at the upper room with the, with the twelve and Jesus. And that's why he recognized that action. Or maybe it was just Jesus having a meal with them. The, uh, the Gospel of Luke gives more attention than any of the other Gospels to emphasizing the meals of Jesus. And how many interesting things happen at mealtime there. As a matter of fact, I've often wondered about the significance of the fact that Jesus was better known at his meals than he was in his Bible study. Maybe we ought to have more church suppers and less church prayer meetings. I don't know. <laughs> but let's go on. Verse 32. They said to each other, didn't our hearts grow warm within us as he was talking with us on the road, the way he opened the scriptures to us? I love that he opened the scriptures to us. Opened. That's an important word here. Especially when you link it with the word just in the verse before, where their eyes were opened. Matter of fact, a few verses later, verse 45, it's actually in the next episode here. It's a different setting. It talks about the risen Jesus that opened their minds. Verse 33. And that very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem where they found the eleven and those who had assembled with them. The eleven were saying that the master really had been raised and had appeared to Simon. So they began to tell what happened on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Ah, that's it. Recognized in the breaking of the bread, just like at communion. Like how we recognize the risen Christ when we share broken bread with each other at love feast and communion. I'm also interested in the idea that Cleopas and his companion are so excited that they head back to Jerusalem immediately. I remember they had already said that it was getting pretty dark outside. That may mean that they did part of their journey back to Jerusalem when it was pitch dark. Or maybe just moonlight, maybe the most dangerous time for walking, but they had to go. This was priority. Actually, the story about the walking to Emmaus with Jesus continues a little bit, merging into the next episode. But let's leave it there and pull together some thoughts. Luke tells us that it's about seven miles to, from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You could walk that, if you walk rather sharply, in maybe two hours, maybe a little bit more. But even Jesus couldn't teach the, teach the whole Old Testament in two hours. Well, if he could, his students couldn't pick it up that fast. There had to be some selections, some choosing what passages need to be given. What would Jesus have picked? 
Well, when he talked about how necessary it is that the Messiah suffer, maybe one of the passages would be Isaiah. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our griefs. Maybe he would have picked Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Maybe he would have picked Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? Maybe he would have gone to Jeremiah and, and, and lifted up that passage about the new covenant, Jeremiah says, is coming. One not written on stone, written in your heart. The commandments, the covenant written on your heart, that almost perfectly matches the story of the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Where Jesus says it's not just refraining from murder, it's also refraining from letting your heart feel murderous. Maybe Jesus, in selecting passages from the Old Testament, went all the way back to maybe Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. And also in Leviticus, love the alien, the immigrant as yourself because you were once aliens in the land of Egypt. Two points here are interesting to me. One, Jesus seems to want to make it clear that his ministry, his life, his death, his teachings, the whole thing, this is all rooted in the Old Testament. Every now and then I run into somebody that will say to me, I'm a New Testament person. <clears throat> I'm not an Old Testament person. I don't think Jesus would have said that. The second point is to wonder how might we understand the Old Testament if it were being interpreted to us by the risen Christ? What parts would we choose and say these need to be emphasized? What difference would it make to read the Old Testament with his eyes? Thinking about this experience of Cleopas and his companion reminds me that if I really believe in the resurrected Christ, there will be times when the resurrected Christ is with me and I don't even know it. Perhaps speaking to me through somebody who has joined me briefly on my journey through life. And if that's the case, I need to be aware and sensitive to every human interaction that comes my way. Listening for his voice, being ready to respond to his call. Or maybe it's not through someone else necessarily it may be the risen Christ himself who knocks on the door of my heart. Revelations 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with them. And they with me. Just like at Emmaus. And once that happens... Once the risen Christ enters that hollow space inside you that's empty and waiting, then it becomes an inner sanctuary full of joy and thanksgiving and light. And no Sunday is ever low Sunday again. It's all quasi-mundo, like newborn infants yearning for spiritual milk. Open the door. Let risen Christ in. And Lord our God, we offer our thoughts and our hearts to you. Live in us. Direct us. Cause us to go where you want us to go. Say what you want us to say. And be who you created us to be. Amen. If you'll stand with me, hymn number 544, when we walk with the Lord, we know this one.
Let us go and walk in the way of Jesus this week. Amen.